thank you to the organizers for also giving me the possibility to present my work. So yeah, I'm Paolo Erdmann, I'm a postdoc here at the Freie Universität, and I'll be talking about what I've been doing in the last few years here, which is more or less using reinforcement learning for problems in quantum thermodynamics. This work was done together with my supervisor, Frank Noe, here at the Freie Universität, and together with collaborators at the University of Geneva, Paolo Abiuso, Alberto Rolandi, and Marti Pernaulobet. So since this is not a conference about quantum thermodynamics, I'll try to say in a nutshell, what is quantum thermodynamics? I would say one way to motivate to describe this is that it's a study of thermodynamics at the nanoscale. So thermodynamics was initially thought with, um, developed with macroscopic systems in mind, and here it's really understanding that these concepts apply and how to apply them at the nanoscale when you have few degrees of freedom. So at a fundamental point of view, people in the community are trying to even understand how to properly state a lot of thermodynamics in nanoscale systems when the coupling between the bath and the quantum system is strong. Um, other people are interested in studying the dynamics of energy, heat, and charge in nanoscale uh, systems. And one important element or distinction is that we have large fluctuations possibly in the thermodynamic quantities. And from a more, let's say, uh, applicative point of view, people are trying to understand if there's a possibility to, de to develop quantum devices and technology. For example, the equivalent of a thermal machine, so a heat engine or refrigerator, but at the nanoscale. Or, for example, people have been studying the dynamics of energy transfer between quantum systems. So in this presentation, I'll focus on uh, driven thermal machines, so let's say heat engines and refrigerators. And from an abstract point of view, what I have in mind is the following. So we have some system that in time can be coupled to a hot bath and exchange some heat. We can couple it to some cold bath and exchange some heat. And importantly, we have a, a set of time-dependent controls that we can control in time. And these allow us to control the state of the system, but also to exchange work with the system. So for example, if this control U was a position of the piston, and this is a gas in a piston, if we allow it to expand, we can extract work from the system. And yeah, I'll focus on the heat engine application, where is where we want to extract work from a temperature difference, and the refrigerator where is where we want to refrigerate the cold bath by putting work into the system. And of course, since this is a quantum physics conference, we will replace this uh, classical system with some open quantum system. And these represent some, some external controls that we have, for example, a gate voltage or some magnetic field that we have on the quantum system. So to give an idea from an experimental point of view, what, uh, how, this, how can we study these systems? Um, okay. My computer just froze, I think. Oh, there we go. Uh, one platform where we can study these systems are, uh, so we're conducting circuit QEDs. So this is a device that was studied at the, the Alto University in Helsinki. Here in the center, you see a superconducting qubit that is coupled to these two resistors at the end. And these resistors can have a different temperature. And they behave as a thermal bath of microwave photons for the qubit. So in this experiment, they could actually measure the heat that was flowing from the hot reservoir to, to this cold one mediated by this qubit. And through this additional line, one can think of adding a drive into the system and try to implement some kind of cycle or control. Another platform are, uh, let's say, quantum dots. So this is a device that was fabricated in Pisa at the Nest Laboratory. Here in this green line is an indium arsenide nanowire. And if we zoom in the center here, we see these two layers of indium phosphide that behave pretty much as barriers for the electrons. So in this experiment, they could confine electrons in this 20 nanometer space, and the spatial confinement brings um, discretization of the energy levels, and this is the definition of a quantum dot. And here they can apply a temperature difference across the wire and, and drive a um, charge current against the voltage bias. And another example, again, are trapped ions. So here, for example, we see an ion that is trapped using laser fields, and by changing the trapping in time, one can implement the equivalent of a Carnot or an Otto cycle, even in these systems. So I would say the main difference, yeah, is that in classical systems, we have in mind macroscopic systems. Uh, the state, therefore, since we have 10 to the 23, say, particles, is typically close to equilibrium, and therefore we have small fluctuations. Where we're working now is kind of in the opposite regime, where we have very few degrees of freedom, so few electrons, few um, ions, or arguably the smallest quantum system, just a two-level system. So the state can be driven far from equilibrium, and we really have to solve for the quantum dynamics of the system and there could be large fluctuations in the thermodynamic quantities. So mathematically, uh, one way to describe it is the following. So we can assume that the overall system, including the bath and the quantum system, obey um, unitary dynamics. And the overall Hamiltonian has one term that describes our small quantum system, for example, a qubit, 
and it depends locally on some time-dependent control. We have a term describing the bath and a term describing the coupling between the system and the bath. And under some assumptions, so for example, if we assume that the coupling is weak and we make the Markovian approximation, we can trace out, let's say, the presence uh, of the bath and we can derive the Lindblad equation for uh, the reduced density matrix rho of the quantum system. So we can have an effective description of the dynamics of the quantum system in the presence of the bath given by the Lindblad equation, which is essentially a first order differential equation for the state rho, which explicitly depend on, on our controls. Okay, so let's assume now that we have a cycle, so we have some periodic drive in U, U of T, our controls. How do we characterize the performance of an engine? So we can look at the power, which is simply work over time. We can look at the efficiency, which is the work we extract divided by the input heat, or equivalently, we could think of reducing the entropy production. And we could also look at the power fluctuation. So since we're a nanoscale system, even the output power can fluctuate, and we can quantify it in terms of the variance of the work distribution divided by time. And what we want to answer is which functions UDT, so which cycles maximize these quantities. So we know that there is fundamentally trade-off between these three quantities, so we cannot simultaneously optimize them. I guess between power and efficiency, it's quite intuitive. If you have a, an engine that's really powerful, it has low efficiency, and vice versa. And even here, power fluctuations enter these trade-offs. As was nicely shown, for example, in these so-called thermodynamic uncertainty relations, this inequality between these three quantities shows that if you want, for example, low power fluctuations, then you will have to sacrifice either power or efficiency and so on. So how do we deal with the fact that we cannot simultaneously optimize these quantities? We look for Pareto optimal cycles. So these are defined as a collection of all cycles where we cannot further improve one quantity, say power, without sacrificing another one. So we will look for a collection of cycles that are optimal in, in this sense. And okay, in this presentation, I will neglect fluctuations, although we studied them in, in some other work. And to find them explicitly under some assumptions, so if this Pareto front is convex, it can be shown that you can find these so-called Pareto optimal cycles simply by optimizing a figure of merit, which is a um, linear combination of your objectives. So here we have P is the power, sigma is the entropy production, and A is just a number between zero and one. So if we optimize this, say for A equal to one, we're simply optimizing the power, for A equal to zero, we're minimizing, because there's a minus, the entropy production. And for intermediate values, we will find trade-offs between these two quantities. So there have been many approaches in literature to study the optimization of heat engines, uh, quantum, of quantum heat engines. For example, people have uh, proposed cycles based on the Otto cycle or the Carnot cycle, and optimized, for example, over the period of these cycles or the duration of the strokes. Another approach is to do an expansion, a perturbative expansion of the driving speed um, compared to the thermalization time scale of the quantum system. Another approach is to use, as mentioned in the previous talk, shortcuts to adiabaticity to take a cycle that works well in, um, in the adi adiabatic limit and try to study them at finite time using shortcuts to adiabaticity. And also variational approaches such as Pontryagin's maximum principle have been uh, applied. However, these three methods, except for variational approaches, we're not guaranteed that these um, will give us the optimal solution in the Pareto optimal sense. So what we want to do is develop simply a numerical method based on reinforcement learning that doesn't uh, require any um, assumption on the structure of the cycle, nor on the driving speed. In principle, we could even apply this to experimental devices without a precise knowledge of the model. So we don't need to have a model-based method. We could in principle, apply it to an experimental device and try to optimize it. It's a framework that allows us to handle noise quite naturally in, in the control. And yeah, it's been also recently proposed to um, reduce the entropy production in closed quantum systems. And as another motivation, these are, for example, the percentage of papers that use machine learning in chemistry, physics, and material science. And in the last few years, it's been increasing quite rapidly. And these are different applications of machine learning just in quantum physics. So these are different, uh, yeah, let's see, directions that have been taken. So what we wanted to do is to try to apply some methods when, when it makes sense of machine learning also to, let's say, problems in quantum thermodynamics. So reinforcement learning, maybe many of you are familiar with it. Anyway, it's a framework that allows to solve optimization problems that are formulated in this way. We have a computer agent that has to master some task by interacting with some environment. In this case, the environment is our quantum heat engine. And what we do, we discretize time in small time steps. And at every time step, the agent has to choose an action. 
the action corresponds to, in this case, the value of the control that will be kept constant for time dt. And we additionally add this discrete action d, which corresponds to whether we want to couple our system to the hot bath, to the cold bath, or to just do an adiabatic evolution. And this is motivated by typical Carnot cycles or Otto cycles where you have these hot strokes and you have a cold stroke. And so we want to allow the agent to possibly even learn these type of structures, but without biasing it in this direction. Then as reward, we choose what is the power that was delivered by the engine in this time step dt. But since the aim of reinforcement learning is to learn how to choose these actions such that you maximize the sum of the future rewards, we will end up optimizing the power averaged over a long time scale t which scales as one over log gamma, where here gamma is known in reinforcement learning as a discount factor. It's a number between zero and one. And if we choose this close enough to one, we're really optimizing the power over a long time scale, capital T. So in practice, we can imagine here we have control as a function of time. At some initial time, the heat engine will be in some state road zero, and the computer agent will propose some control U that will be held constant for some time delta T. And this color orange means, for example, couple the system to the hot bath. Then it will receive as feedback what is the power that was developed in this time step dt. And based on this, the computer agent can choose, for example, a different value of u that will, um, and still to be coupled, for example, to the hot bath, which is this orange color, and so on and so forth. So by iterating between the computer agent and the system, we can end up building this piecewise constant control. So we first applied it to arguably the simplest model um, of a quantum heat engine, so simply a two-level system that is coupled to a hot and a cold bath. And our control here is the splitting, so the level splitting of this two-level system. And so here what we plot is the, the power of the system as a function of the training steps. Every step corresponds to a single delta t evolution. So this is not a full cycle, it's just a single delta t step. And here we show the actions u that were chosen by the agent as a function of time, zoomed in around these three points during training. So we see first that the actions are completely random, also the color, which was that discrete action is random. But then the power increases, some structure shows up in the control, and we end up converging to the square wave control where we um, alternate coupling to the hot bath and the cold bath. And yeah, in this work we showed analytically that this was indeed the optimal solution for the specific model. So then we applied it to another system where we did not know the exact uh, solution, which is this model of this device that I showed earlier. So here we have a transmon qubit, and our control this time is only over uh, sigma and z. And we have this constant term sigma x. So here, when we change the control, we're also rotating the Hamiltonian, meaning that we will generate coherence in the instantaneous eigenbasis if we tune UDT. And here, so we're controlling the, the qubit in the center, which is coupled to these resistors. And our aim is to cool the, the cold resistor. And so again, here we show the, the cooling power P of R as a function of time. It starts off negative, and then it kind of plateaus to some maximum value. And this corresponds to the cycle shown here as a black thick line at the bottom. So um, what we did, we then compared this to what was proposed in literature, which is this um, dash trapezoidal cycle. And we see that the power that we find is substantially larger than this one that was previously proposed. So to understand where, where does this advantage come from, so we see that this kind of unintuitive jump that we have here in between, this is actually a, a, it's implementing the equivalent of a unitary operation on the qubit that is mitigating this detrimental effect known as quantum friction. So as I was mentioning before, when you rotate here, when you change U, you're rotating the, the Hamiltonian, so you generate coherence in the instantaneous eigenbasis, and this typically has been shown to have a detrimental effect on the power. And so the agent learns to rotate the qubit before thermalizing it with the cold bath. And here we study the same system, but this time I'm showing this trade-off between power and efficiency. So on the Y, we have the cooling power, and the x, the coefficient of performance, and each dot here is a different cycle, so it's a different solution found with that different weight between power and efficiency. And we see that here we have, for example, solutions with high power and low efficiency, and as we move down these points, we can trade power and increase efficiency. And these are, for example, how these controls look in these four dots, and we see, for example, that as we shift from power to efficiency, these cycles become slower and slower, which makes sense. If you want to be more efficient, you should go more reversibly. And then to conclude, we applied it also to a particle trapped in a harmonic potential. So if you want to the quantum harmonic oscillator, and our control is the confinement of the particle. And again, we find here these trade-offs between power and efficiency. And we compared it to these auto cycles that were proposed um, in this reference. And it's interesting to see that these cycles look actually remarkably similar. So the dots are the reinforcement learning methods, and the dashed is the 
uh, is the auto cycle. And we didn't bias our method to find these type of structures. But we have some additional features, for example, this ramping or this unitary control that allows us to get a slightly higher power and to match the efficiency of the auto cycles. So to conclude, yeah, I briefly um, described how we can use reinforcement learning for quantum thermal machines. We've seen that it uh, typically performs better than what was pr proposed based on intuition. We have a model free extension, so where the agent doesn't really need to observe the state of the system. And in fact, those, those uh, Pareto fronts that I showed were actually found using this method here. We've also studied a full multi-objective optimization, including power fluctuations. And we're looking at extending this to a description beyond the weak coupling regime. And as further applications, we're also using reinforcement learning to study the um, a many body quantum battery based on the Dickey model. We would like to include also quantum measurements and feedback, which seem to be a big topic at this conference. And yeah, I think we should also study many body systems and heat engines. And that's it. Thank you. Follow. Yes, thank you for this very interesting talk. So what about the model you use to describe with the Lindblad equation, the interaction with the hot and the cold bath? Mm -hmm. So you, uh, this uh, typically for, for the qubit example, I guess it is with a sigma plus and sigma minus, I guess. Yes, yes. So we have jump operators in the instantaneous yes. eigenbasis. Yeah. In this, so. Which is arguable. If the driving is fast, you might have to use a non adiabatic mass equation mm -hmm. that, for example, Rania studied, studied mm -hmm. or one can use the Floquet master equation. So when the driving is really fast compared to the adiabatic time scale of the yeah. system, yeah, one should use, take this into account. It should, one should be able to apply this machinery equivalently to these different ones. But in literature, when we wanted to compare to these other papers, they use the standard one. So we use the same model to, to okay. be able to compare. Okay. But that's you're good. right. Yeah, okay. that's a good point. Yeah. More questions? Two little questions uh, first. Do you compare your results uh, at some point with a variational approach? Yeah, so no, we didn't because in these specific systems we're not studied with variation approaches. So in those other ones, what they did, they fixed the structure where they have like a cold part, cold stroke, a hot stroke, and they do some optimization piecewise. Um, no, we didn't do a full comparison because it was also this discrete action that is not clear to me how to take into account in this variational approach. Because when you have continuous parameters, okay, one can do point tracking or other methods. When you have also this discrete action, it seems, at least for me, more complicated, but not, I'm not an expert about that yet. Thanks again, Paulo.